Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that we can make heaven our home, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you and I praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can make heaven our home, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated. Turning your attention to Luke chapter 22, and beginning with verse 7, Luke tells us, Now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, Go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. He replied, as soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house that he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. They went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled In the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this. To remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. And that typically is where we stop. But the next verse tells us that Jesus goes on. Other Gospels put it at different points within the supper. But he says, but here at this table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. For it has been determined that the Son of Man must die. But what sorrow awaits the one who betrays him? The disciples began to ask each other which of them would ever do such a thing. If you go to Matthew and you go to Mark, you will find there in those passages an additional item, a detail, that Jesus identifies the betrayer as the one who reaches in and takes bread and dips it into the sop with him. What is striking is that this moment is the moment where God in the flesh is taking an observation of deliverance, the Passover. And He is bringing it forward into a new meaning. A meaning whereby Generation after generation after generation of Christian is called upon by him to remember that by his blood shed upon that cross and by his body broken upon that cross, he has created a new covenant. A covenant that has fulfilled what he began in the old covenant. 
Jesus in another passage says, I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. In fact, not one jot or one tittle of that shall fall, but I have come to fulfill it. To bring it to perfection. To bring it to what it was intended to be. And it's this moment that he is crystallizing in the life of the church what he is doing. And yet in the midst of this momentous occasion, in the midst of this seminal moment, in the midst of Of something that is going to have an impact upon all of humanity. Upon thousands and millions and billions of believers. Jesus still has time for the individual. I ask you, what is the point? Why does he say there sits among us one who will betray me? He's not going to stop him. He doesn't stop him. It didn't have to be this way, but we do know that Jesus was determined to go to the cross. Because he knew what he had come for. So the purpose was not to stop Judas. Was it to betray him in the sense of out him to his friends? Well, Jesus does that quite ineffectively, if that was his purpose. For he never names him. What is God up to in this momentous occasion where his mind's eye has to be upon what is ahead of him? And its impact upon all the world. What was Jesus' point? Why was he doing this? And Today I would like to submit to you. On a day of celebration. On a day of thanksgiving. On a day of remembrance. That the Son of God. God Himself in flesh was still reaching for the lost cause. He was still reaching for that wrong-headed human being. He was still reaching for the one who had made a decision. And He was hoping would perhaps change his mind. You see, God is interested in giving humanity the opportunity to be honest with themselves. And that honesty leads to what I call self-disclosure. We see it the first time humanity sins. Adam and Eve eat of the tree. They've been told not to. And then their eyes are opened. And their nakedness of purity becomes nakedness of shame. And they begin to try to clothe themselves with leaves. They're hiding in the bushes. And here comes God who knows everything, who sees everything. Nothing gets by him. And he says, Adam, where are you? Was God really asking where Adam was? I would submit to you absolutely not. He already knew where Adam was. Subsequent questions. Who told you that you were naked? Did God really need to know who told Adam he was naked? I would submit to you, no. God already knew how Adam knew that he was naked. Those questions were designed to give Adam and Eve the opportunity to choose. Even after they had already chosen. And because of that choice... Sinned. God comes again to them and gives them the opportunity to choose, to self-disclose, to be honest with self. 
And I would submit to you today on this day of remembrance of what our Savior did for us. Of the death that He took for us. Of the salvation He purchased for us. Of the blood He shed on our behalf. Of the body He broke for us. That God's focus is still the same. And He's come here this morning. And He comes here every time that we gather together. And He asks us questions. And He makes statements that are not about identifying us in order to shame us. That are not about identifying us in order to stop us. But He comes here for one purpose. And that is to again give us choice. Will we be honest with ourselves. Will we be honest. With him. I know that many of the gospel writers. Tell us. That Satan entered into. Judas. And I know that typically we have interpreted that to mean. That he became possessed. But I would submit to you today. That while that interpretation is common. I don't agree with it. I don't believe. That Satan entered in and took over Judas any more. Than the time that I'm tempted. And respond. From my humanity and my desires that Satan has taken me over. Has he entered in in the sense of tempting me? Absolutely. Is he present? Is he there? Is he active? Absolutely. But I still have choice. And God, at the moment that he is beginning, this is the starting line. Everything has been leading up to this point. Because from the moment that this takes place, everything begins to fall into place. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. There he prays, asking for the cup to pass from him. The soldiers come. They arrest him. He's taken to the high priest. He's taken to Herod. He's taken to Pontius Pilate. He's beaten. Crowns of thorns are placed upon his head. Purple robes are placed upon his back. He is buffeted. A cross is placed upon his back. He falls. Another carries his cross. He's taken to Golgotha. His hands are nailed there to the wood that he created. His feet are pierced and put upon that post. And he hangs between heaven and earth that he created. To die for you and for me. All of that. And Jesus' focus is on Judas. The very one. Who is going to serve as the instrument. Unnecessarily. To betray him. So this morning I look at you and I say with strong confidence that while God is concerned about all of humanity this morning, His eye is on you. Because in the midst of remembrance, there's choice. Your choice. God has come here this morning and I don't have the application. So I trust that by the Spirit, each of you are receiving that quickening, that application within your own life. But today, God is looking at you and saying, you don't have to go that way. You've already talked to the high priest. You've already made the arrangements. But if you'll just disclose yourself. The other gospels tell us that after Jesus made the statement about dipping into the cup, into the sop. That Judas does this and Jesus then turns to him and says. Go what thou doest. Do it quickly. I interpret this to mean that somehow Judas indicated that he was not willing to self-disclose. 
That he was not willing to reverse his action. And those of you that have been around here long enough, you know that I've even preached that once the betrayal had occurred, Judas should have gone to that cross and fallen at the feet of that Savior. And if this Bible has given me an accurate understanding of who Jesus is, even at that moment, Just as surely as he found a way to save the thief. Jesus would have saved Judas. So today. In this moment. Where like millions of times before. Human beings have obeyed the command of Jesus. To take bread, to take the fruit of the vine, and thereby memorialize, remember, give thanksgiving for his broken body and his shed blood that instituted a new covenant of salvation, of forgiveness of sins between God and his people. In this moment, I ask you to think for a moment. What is the choice that is in front of you? Because I know without a shadow of a doubt that God has asked me to turn your focus to a portion that normally we would read over. To a section that we normally would uncomfortably ignore. To a man that we have loved as Christians to hate. Vilify. And speak bad of. To such an extent that our Christian culture, if you call someone a Judas... It immediately means they are a liar, they are a cheat, they are a betrayer. But here, in this moment, at the starting line, where Jesus is about to begin those steps that lead Him to the sacrifice of Calvary. He literally exemplifies what He told us in the parable. The good shepherd who has a hundred sheep and one is lost leaves the ninety and nine and goes and searches for the one that is lost. Now if you are offended by considering yourself a Judas I strongly and respectfully ask you, have you ever chosen to disobey God? From the front of this sanctuary to the back of this sanctuary, if we are willing to be honest, the unequivocal answer, the unanimous answer is, Yes. So we are in no better position than Judas. With the exception that we are now at a place that he was before us. We have a choice to make. We have a decision to make. Stick to our plan. Go the way we've decided to go. Insist that our way is right. Excuse. Explain. Rationalize. Repeat what is natural within us. As surely as our father Adam and our mother Eve did before us. Blame others. Or, 
Do we take the opportunity and the offer of the Savior whose eye is on the one whose heart is heavy for the lost? And will we humble ourselves? Will we self-disclose? Will we take the opportunity to choose? I have long preached and taught that the most powerful force in the universe is what God gave us when He made us in His image and after His likeness. And that is the ability to choose. Unlike the rest of creation, we are the only creature who consistently and without fail have the capacity to overrule ourselves. We are the only people that run into fire. You start a fire and animals will run from it. They do not run into it. But we run into it. You shoot at a deer and it will run from you. It will never run towards you. We are the only people who will, as firing is happening, as bullets are flying, we will run into them. This rational reflection of the image of God is before you today. Everyone has it. Does it matter how badly life has gone for you? Does not matter. And I'm not saying I don't care about all that you've gone through. But it does not matter how badly you have been messed up. You still have that image of God within you. And that image of God gives you the capacity to overrule everything that has been wrong before. You have the ability. And today... As we are about to turn to the remembrance and the thanksgiving for what he did for us at Calvary. I ask you, what choice is in front of you today? For some of you, this sermon may need to be filed away for a future moment. But for at least one person here today, for if it were not this case, I would not be preaching it. But for at least one person today, you know why I'm preaching this. Like Judas, you are hidden. Like Judas, you've not yet gone through with it. And like Judas, your Savior is calling out to you saying, please, reconsider. Please make a different choice. Because in the midst of this moment in which God is instituting a sacred time, a time where the church remembers. The Apostle Paul instructs that as oft as you eat this bread, and as often as you drink this blood, you declare the Lord's death until He comes. It's a part of our Christian witness. It's a part of our Christian life. In the midst of this, many times ignored by us, Jesus is focused on the one. And see, no matter how bad you've sinned, I don't think you can get any worse than Judas. No matter what you've done, I don't think you can say that it's any worse than Judas. 
So if God loved Judas and was reaching for him, how much more does God love you and is reaching for you? There's no way that you can remove his love from you. You can't ignore the reality. Because if he could love Judas, if he could forgive Judas, if he was reaching for Judas, then he also loves you. He also can forgive you. And he also is reaching for you. It has amazed me since I felt the Lord begin to lead that we needed to celebrate His death and His burial. That new covenant in the Eucharist, in the Last Supper, in communion, more frequently. It has amazed me that no matter how many times we do it, there is more to be learned. There is more to be observed. There's times I even chuckle and say to him, Hey Lord, that was a good one. You're going to have a tough time topping that one. And I just hear his voice coming back at me. Oh, you have no idea. Because this moment is a moment in human terms. You can't get much more human. It's sensory. It's material. You're eating something. You're touching it. You're tasting it. You're smelling it. You're looking at it. The only thing you don't have is hearing it. Four out of the five senses are involved in the remembrance of the Lord through communion. But in this human moment, that we are about to share as a community, individually and yet corporately. Something spiritual also happens. And today for someone or someones, the Master has presented you with choice in the midst of remembrance. There's no indication within Scripture, and in fact, when you take the other gospel accounts, there's strong indication in the opposite, that when Jesus passed around the bread, Judas ate it. And when Jesus passed around the cup, Judas drank it. God is not prohibiting you from remembering Him. But He is placing choice before you in the midst of remembrance. And so what is your decision? Now most preachers would say at this point I need to call an altar call. Most would say now's the time to give people the opportunity to pray. But I believe within the Spirit's leading that now is the time that we turn immediately to the remembrance. That perhaps the feebleness of my words can be brought to the crescendo they need to by the mystical and spiritual moment of remembrance. Because this morning, God is bringing you to face choice in the midst of remembrance. 
if my ushers would come at this point. If you would all stand with me. And by section, as we give in the offering, would you come, take of the bread, take of the cup, return to your seat and wait so that we can do it together. Come now. As I already referenced to you, the Apostle Paul, in words that resonate almost word for word with the Gospel of Luke, wrote to the church at Corinth and said, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord Himself. On the night when He was betrayed, 
See, I would submit to you that Judas was still, at the moment that he spoke to Paul, on his mind. The Lord Jesus took some bread, gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. And then the Apostle Paul adds to these statements. He says, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. You may eat and you may drink. Just simply pass your cups down to an end of the aisle. You could even place them in the pew. The ushers will come and gather them and throw them away. This altar is now open. Would you come and talk to Jesus? It is now a time of prayer. Would you come and pray? Jesus, I worship you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus.
how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Sing it with me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. One more time through. Oh, how. He loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Would you love him back right now? All across this congregation, would you love the Lord Jesus Christ? I love you, Lord. Yes, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Oh, Lord, even if I at this moment am not in the position of Judas, if ever I find myself there, you love me enough to reach out for me. Oh, how great is your love for me, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Savior. Thank you, Lord and Master. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Oh, we praise Your name for You are awesome. You are awesome, oh God. You are awesome, oh God. And I praise You. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank You, Lord Jesus. Thank You, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yes, Father, I love You. I worship You and I praise You, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallel
Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There is none like You, O oh God. There is none like You. Your great love for us. Your great mercy. Your tender mercy. Your kindness towards us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Jesus, I praise you and I worship you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. hallelujah. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. And in this moment of great love, I remind you that God calls upon us because of this love to extend that love to others. Hence his commandment, forgive and you will be forgiven. So today, don't just take this unto yourself. Don't just take this unto yourself, but extend it to others. In yourself, you cannot forgive, you cannot love, but through Him, you can. You can extend this same love, this same forgiveness to others because of His Spirit, because of His sacrifice. Praise God. It has been an honor and a privilege to be in the presence of the King this morning. Mm. He showed up here today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't take this for granted. Please, don't take this for granted. 
Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You are dismissed. 5 o'clock prayer, 6 o'clock service this night. Come and join us.